25 years ago, John Wheeler formulated his three-syllable syllable manifesto, uh, articulating his view about what would be required to unify quantum mechanics and gravity. And his three syllables were it from bit. Now, I think Wheeler, uh, his vision was perhaps sound, but he was 25, well, at least roughly 20, 20 years too early, uh, in that the tools that he would have needed to, to succeed at that time didn't exist. We didn't know enough about uh, how quantum mechanics and gravity affected each other, uh, and we also didn't know enough about the quantum mechanics, uh, about the information in quantum mechanics. Uh, but over the past you know, five years, 10 years or so, we've learned a tremendous amount on both fronts, and I think that the, uh, some of the prizes this year, the New Horizons Physics Prizes, uh, exemplify uh, the kind of work that fuses interesting information theoretic ideas with fundamental physics. And so I think that we are on the cusp of really making serious progress on Wheeler's vision, and I want to tell you about one part of where I think we can make progress in the next five years over the next uh, few minutes. Now, I wrote this as part one uh, only because I didn't want to suggest that we were going to finish the story, but of course it really should be part three, that significant work has happened, significant work is going to happen in the future, uh, and this will be a snapshot of what I hope is going to happen soon. So, all right, so on the off chance that there may actually be non-physicists in the audience, which I thought was a possibility given the nature of the meeting, uh, we can start with the holographic principle, uh, the idea that all information uh, uh, in a region of space is actually encoded or can be encoded in some sense as a hologram living on the region's bounding surface. Now, of course, uh, Lenny and Gerard de Hooft uh, formulated this idea more than 20 years ago, and at first it seems completely crazy because if you just arrange a bunch of atoms in a, in a crystal, for example, and each atom has at least two states, then you can clearly encode an amount of information into a region of space which is proportional to the volume of that region, not uh, to its area. Of course, it's not so crazy because a black hole is the most information dense object possible in the universe, and the entropy of a black hole is proportional to its area and not its volume. So that idea uh, was given concrete realization in Maldacena's uh, ADS-CFT correspondence. Um, so there the, the idea, again, is that we have a quantum mechanical theory of gravity in two plus um, D dimensions. Uh, and that theory, quantum mechanical theory of gravity is going to be dual, equivalent to a theory without gravity in one fewer spatial dimensions, a conformal field theory living on the boundary of that space. Uh, so we're going to make use of this idea and try to see what, uh, what kind of sense we can make of it. Uh, now, the important thing about anti-de Sitter space uh, is that if you take a spatial slice of anti-de Sitter, that geometry is hyperbolic space. And so the way that you measure distances between pairs of points uh, in this uh, Escher, Escher drawing is that it's the fish counting metric. The shortest, point, uh, shortest distance between a pair of points is the minimal number of fish that you need to pass through to get from point A to point B. So that connection uh, is something that we can, we can store away for a few moments. And back in 2007, another quantum information theorist, uh, Guifre Vidal, uh, interested really in under, uh, developing numerical techniques for simulating condensed matter systems at phase transitions, uh, came up with a, an ansatz for describing what the ground states of those, phys, uh, of those systems would look like. And the obstacle previously uh, to simulating such sim systems was simply that uh, if you have, say, uh, a ring of spins, uh, so the spins would live around the, uh, around the circle here, uh, then the Hilbert space associated with that ring of spins is going to grow exponentially with the number of spins, which is uh, disastrous for any kind of numerical, uh, numerical uh, techniques. Um, Giffrey's idea was to actually try to represent the quantum state uh, as the contraction of a large tensor network where the individual tensors are not that big. So the idea is that a, a, a roughly scale invariant structure like the one that I just drew right there, in which each of the vertices is a tensor, so a matrix would be one of these little vertices with two legs coming out, uh, two, or a, a three-dimensional matrix is a, uh, a vertex with three legs coming out, a four-dimensional uh, matrix likewise with four legs coming out. And this was his idea, uh, and since then this has actually proved to be quite fruitful. It, provided, you know, it has provided at least a, a numerical technique which has not yet solved all problems that we'd like to solve, but is allowing us to make significant progress. So, a few years after that, uh, Brian Swingle, now a postdoc uh, here at Stanford, uh, looked at these tensor networks and made the observation that the fish counting metric in, the, in, a, uh, in hyperbolic space on the, on the left uh, is essentially the same thing as the link crossing network in the tensor network on the right. 
that if you want to know the distance between two points in this network on the right, you could ask what is the minimal number of links that you have to cross to get from point A to point B? And both of those give you some kind of discrete approximation to hyperbolic space. And that led Swingle to hypothesize that perhaps this, uh, this tensor network representing the ground state of the conformal field theory uh, in ADS-CFT is in fact uh, the geometry, a coarse grain description of the geometry itself. And that's a vision that uh, at, you know, at the time was a, you know, it was, a, it was a picture. And I think that over the next five years, we're gonna be able to give it a very concrete and useful realization. And so I'd like to just give you a little bit of the, uh, the story about why I think that's the case. Uh, so I guess, again, this is uh, something worth mentioning because it is the, uh, the work that led to Ryu and Takianagi being awarded the New Horizons Prize last night. Uh, if you want, in this ADS-CFT correspondence, one of the elements of the dictionary, the one that they proposed, uh, is the interpretation of the length of a geodesic uh, in, the, in the bulk theory. And what Ryu and Takianagi uh, proposed was that the length of a geodesic that starts and ends on the boundary, I, I'm, I'm speaking here in the special case of uh, one plus one dimensional, two plus one dimensional bulk, but this generalizes, uh, that the length of that geodesic is the entropy associated with the interval subtended by the geodesic uh, in the boundary theory. And so if you only pay attention to part of the boundary uh, and you have to throw away some other degrees of freedom and integrate over them, that generates some uncertainty. There's, un there's entropy associated with that uncertainty and that entropy uh, would be the length of the associated geodesic. Uh, and this is, a, you know, th this is a wonderful proposal uh, because it gives us some concrete uh, identification of the degrees of freedom in the boundary associated with a particular region in the bulk. Now whether it is uh, the degrees of freedom associated with the geodesic itself, with the region inside the geodesic nearby, that's not completely clear, and so we'd like to make more progress. Uh, as an information theorist, uh, I like to give concrete operational uh, interpretations to numbers like entropy. I don't trust them unless I can actually point to a particular process that describe, you know, whose answer is given by that entropy. And entropy we're, f we're familiar with, uh, we think of it as the, effect, the exponential of entropy as being the effective dimension of the Hilbert space. And so in my quantum information scientist language, what I would say is that if there were an Alice who had control of this ring, uh, so the ring is just some exotic material uh, whose physics is described by conformal field theory, and if this Alice has control of a segment of that ring and she can feed uh, the, the degrees of freedom into a quantum computer, and has that ask for that quantum computer to compress uh, the, uh, the state as much as possible, the number of qubits required is going to be precisely, or roughly speaking, this entropy. Uh, and so that is the interpretation of the entropy. It's the log of the effective Hilbert space dimension. Equivalently, uh, you could ask a, what seems like a slightly contorted question. You could say, well, what if, what if this Alice uh, wanted to try to teleport uh, this segment of the boundary theory to her friend Bob? Uh, this gives us another way of quantifying how much information is there. And in this case, quantum teleportation, uh, one bell pair allows us to teleport uh, a single qubit. And so the number of bell pairs required is going to just be exactly the same answer. It's the, it's the length of the curve. Now, there's an interesting uh, analogy going on here, though, which is that a geodesic, or at least a minimal length curve is a geodesic, uh, and the minimal number of qubits required, uh, or bell pairs required, uh, is, well, an information theoretic quantity. And so if we had a curve, which is not a geodesic, uh, does that curve have a, an associated interpretation? And we wanna give that curve an interpretation because we wanna get a better handle on how, quantum, how the bulk degrees of freedom are organized in the boundary theory. Uh, so this is something that actually can be done, uh, building on work of Bala Subramanian et al. in the previous year. Uh, but the compression problem becomes not uh, becomes a more complicated compression problem. There's an in, but there is an information theoretic interpretation. So we speak not about straightforward compression, but streaming compression. So the, the analogy here is that if you're gonna go home uh, after today's uh, session, you're tired, you're gonna watch a movie on Netflix. If Netflix wanted to minimize the number of bits required to send you the movie, what they would do is they'd compress it all at once using the best possible compression algorithm, send you the full movie, and then you, de you know, de decompress it at home. They don't do that because you want to start watching the moment you hit play, right? And so instead, what they do is they send you the movie using some sliding compression window, and that imposes an additional cost because they can't use the most efficient algorithm. And so the same story is going to be true here. 
is that if you have a bulk curve, which is not a geodesic, uh, then what you can do is you can map that bulk curve to a sequence of intervals on the boundary. What you do is you take a, a set of tangent geodesics at each point, those cut out intervals on the boundary, and then those intervals give you a sequence of windows for a streaming teleportation protocol. Uh, and here's our Alice who'd want to send a message to Bob. And the structure of that protocol is going to be uh, at the earliest stage, this Alice has access only to the most ultraviolet degrees of freedom on the left, and then her interval grows, she gets access to degrees of freedom on larger, larger scale, but only up to some scale, and then she has to move on, move to the right to something else. And so a sequence of restrictions in locality and, uh, uh, and scale in, the, in how you can act on the boundary theory translate directly into an interpretation of the length of the curve. The length of the curve is the minimal cost over all such protocols. Uh, so this is, this is progress, I think, on our understanding of uh, how uh, bulk degrees of freedom are encoded holographically. But ultimately, what we would really like to see is how we can completely reconstruct the, uh, the bulk geometry from boundary degrees of freedom uh, and see if we can give uh, some quantitative precise substance to uh, Swingle's proposal that has been further elaborated by others over the years. And I think that is something that uh, relatively soon, certainly in the case of vacuum ADS in one plus one dimensions, uh, or one plus two, uh, and soon, uh, or relatively soon in higher dimensions, we'll be able to do. Uh, and the key component is that we need to know in this tensor network what's actually sitting in there. Uh, in the numerical experiments, the work that's been done uh, really focuses on relatively small systems, not the kinds of conformal field theories that actually appear in holography. Uh, and in, in those, but for the kinds of uh, field theories that appear in holography, techniques of asymptotic quantum information theory actually apply. And so the basic tensor that's going to appear uh, uh, in the, uh, the tensor network uh, to represent the conformal field theory is something that I think we can get a good handle on uh, in the near future. Uh, and this is going to be a, a little building block, a nut, you know, a nut or a bolt for geometry uh, that compresses in a particular way. And the way that it's going to compress, you know, there are particular numbers associated to it, uh, and it may or, not, may or may not ultimately be exactly the right answer. But here again is the classical analogy to what it's going to do. Uh, it has, you know, if there are two, uh, two input legs and two output legs, uh, say one of them is receiving something like the Wall Street Journal, the other is receiving something like the New York Times, uh, and it's going to output dis the distilled essence of each of these things, made more extreme. And of course, something is lost in that process, and the thing that's lost is the facts. Um, but, uh, and so the, the same story is going to happen, or is the, this, this building block of the compression that I think we can actually build uh, is going to uh, isolate the correlations of the inputs with the rest of the world while, while also removing what is in common between them. Uh, so rather than removing facts, what it's actually going to remove is correlation up to a given scale in the theory. And these things I think we actually ha can develop a really good handle on them using quantum information theory fairly soon. And this will give us, uh, I hope, uh, really a construction, a, uh, a tensor network, coarse-grained tensor network description of a holographic uh, theory. Now, there's a twist, uh, which has been uh, uh, championed by uh, Bartek Cech uh, and his collaborators Lamprou and Sully, that in fact, the tensor network may not be describing ADS itself, but a kind of dual geometry uh, in which uh, the points of the tensor network correspond to minimal surfaces. Uh, of, the, of the actual bulk geometry. So this may be an important part of the ingredient and we're gonna have to sort it out. Now, the last part of this story uh, is the observation that uh, the construction that I've been describing to you and that I hope is going to actually be uh, nailed down in the next few years, uh, it builds this tensor network by trying to sort out the structure of correlations in the boundary theory and map those into the bulk. Uh, but by Thinking about the time evolution of wormholes, uh, Lenny Susskind and, and his collaborators have uh, come close to convincing me over the past year that that's not going to be enough of the story. Uh, in particular, if we study uh, a wormhole in this uh, two-sided ADS geometry, uh, that long after the left-hand side and the right-hand side have individually thermalized, the geometry continues to change. And in particular, the wormhole gets longer and longer. And so, Lenny and his collaborators have proposed that, in fact, the minimal size tensor network required to describe uh, the boundary state and all of, its, uh, all of its structure is going to correspond to the volume of the, uh, of the wormhole. 
Now, for, now from the point of view of an information theorist, this is a radical and interesting proposal uh, because the kinds of things I was telling you about, about before were just about uh, separating out simple correlation structure in the boundary theory. But, and so th those are information theoretic ideas. But here, the size of a minimal tensor network is actually a computational complexity idea. You're interested in the, you know, the most efficient way to describe a particular quantum state. Uh, and it is quite remarkable that this proposal uh, seems to have quite detailed quantitative agreement, uh, not just in the case of the, uh, of the wormhole evolving as I've described here, but in more complicated geometries uh, involving wormholes that have been constructed using shock waves, a sequence of shock waves uh, being sent into the black hole. And so, uh, again, in the next five years, we're going to have to try to understand not just how to construct simple ADS space, but that's a first step, but how to go beyond the horizon, and going on beyond the horizon uh, seems like it may involve computational complexity. So that is, that is what I think and I hope we're going to be able to do. We're gonna make significant progress uh, on actually uh, being able to say in a detailed way how to construct bulk observables uh, using this tensor ne network formalism. Uh, but the biggest challenges remain. How do we describe precisely what's going on behind the horizon? Uh, as Joe uh, spent a good deal of time uh, explaining to us, this is difficult to reconcile with linear quantum mechanics. And we're gonna have to ask the question, do we have to, uh, do we have to modify quantum mechanics? Uh, the, the superposition of two simple uh, tensor networks is not itself a simple tensor network. And everything that I've been describing, or time has played only a marginal part in what I've been describing so far. Uh, and really seeing how these networks uh, can be thought of dynamically is a huge challenge, a very large challenge that we're gonna to have to understand. And so, uh, I think five years will be just about enough time. Thanks. Yeah, you go. So, so, sorry to ask such a basic question, but where does the content of the theory come into this? Because you know, as you know, most theories don't have a large radius gravity dual, and if they do, most of most of them are not conformal, conformally invariant. So, right. Well, no. So this is actually uh, I, I didn't write this one down, but uh, what I meant was you know, what I should have written down also that we, we're going to have to cut this crutch or, or you know eliminate this crutch of only working in uh, in the, the format in the formalism of ADS CFT. Uh, that the these tensor networks, as we describe them right that right now, we're talking about a state of the boundary. And we don't really know how to think about them just free floating uh, without that, without something to anchor to. So, so in um, other words, if I give you a field theory Lagrange and you can't tell me a tensor network, it, 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 Oh, well for, no, so for a field, actually, so for a field theory, yes. Like say for the construction that I was describing earlier where I think we're gonna be able to make these little building blocks, uh, the, the input that goes into making that argument work is that uh, essentially the, if you look at the density operator, uh, associated to these different legs coming into the tensors, uh, there has to be some concentration of the eigenvalue uh, distribution for that density operator. And so there are, if there are enough degrees of freedom there and the eigenvalues are tightly concentrated, then, uh, then you should be able to construct this tensor building block uh, and its behavior will be governed only by the entropies of the, of the, uh, of the various related systems. Um, and so, Somehow there's some large, large n, you know, like there's some thermodynamic limit required in order to make this thing work. Uh, but, but there's also something missing, you know, like if you, uh, that in holography there's also the part, you know, the specific structure of the, uh, of the set of conformal uh, dimensions appearing in operators in the theory. And that actually at the moment doesn't play a very significant role. Uh, but that may actually just be, be because we're only looking at the very coarse grain geometry at this point. Um, Sorry? We're not, sorry, we're not able to write a metric at the very end. Uh, I'm not able to write a metric right now, <laughs> but th this, this is what I'm saying is, is, uh, is the program, uh, that, um, that I think we are gonna be able to construct a metric, and that metric, at least in this dual space, uh, I mean, there's even a proposal for what it should look like, that it should be the second derivative of, en of entropy. Yeah, so derivative of, second derivative of S du dv uh, would be actually the, the structure of the metric. Yeah. One, and then mm. yeah. Yeah. One, one comment, trying to reiterate what Eva was saying. So if you have a generic system, even if it is large n, mm -hmm. it might not be described simply by a metric. It might be a higher spin 
uh, gauge theory, for example. It might. Right. So the, the Einstein metric would require an extra constraint, like saying that uh, you know you have all the massive higher spin fields, all the higher spin fields are all ma and so on, and that will be some extra structure of this ten on this tensor or on, or on the original state that you. Right. So th there's the there's some room for that to take place. Actually, I mean, again, this is. Uh, anticipating five years down the road, so we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but as we as we're studying these tens, you know, these little tensor building blocks right now, we have this. In order to argue that the tensor is going to going to exist and going to work, uh, we need this uh, we need this concentration. But we actually need to be able to do it. Not we need to be able to do it recursively, not just a single time. And being able to do it recursively is probably going to pull in more structure from the theory. Uh, but that remains to be seen, exactly how it plays out. So uh, this is obviously early days, but I'm over here. Um, <laughs> but uh, how does time evolution come into this? Uh, would you time evolve on the boundary and then reconstruct the, uh, the, the space-time slice by slice? Or is there a way, to, particularly entangling time evolution, of course? Right. And well, how, do, how does causality in the bulk emerge and things like light sheets or null hypersurfaces, which seem to be important for holography? So, all wonderful questions, um, and I, I don't really know the answer, right? So at the moment, um, if we are willing to work in this, uh, in the setting of ADS-CFT, then we can just think about time evolution in the bulk and try to push it inwards. Now, the extent to which that works, if we want to go behind the horizon, uh, is open to question. Um, but I myself don't have a very clear idea about exactly about what time evolution of the tensor network, uh, if we want to talk about it intrinsically, is going to mean. Um, because of these issues that, uh, among other things, right, that, uh, the, that you can't superpose these tensor networks. Uh, and so that seems to be you know, a, a real tension with how we'd expect quantum mechanical time evolution to work. So I, I, don't, I don't really know. Uh, okay, last question. Um. I don't see why you can't superpose tensor networks, in fact. So, I mean, if you have uh, the superposition of two space times in this uh, description, it would be the superposition of the two tensor networks. But you can superpose them, but they are not a tensor network anymore, right? Well, yeah, well, so you, you can superpose them. Uh, but when you superpose the tensor network, you potentially lose a lot of its internal structure. Um, and so, uh, so if you have a relatively simple tensor network and you superpose it, uh, not too many times, you can end up with a state that if you wanted to describe it as a tensor network involving similarly simple components, uh, would be, it would have much greater complexity. Um, and so, yeah, the, I think the difficulty is in trying to see stability of the structure of the tensor network uh, if, you actually, if you perform superpositions. Like formally, you can superpose them, um, but you, you lose a lot when you do so, I think. Although that may be an interesting constraint. Right, that in, some, in many circum, in circumstances where you can superpose them well, uh, that may actually be an indication that the geometry, uh, you know, telling you something about the structure of the geometry. Okay, so we're a little over time, so uh, let's thank uh, Patrick again. And thank all the speakers.